Hey everybody, welcome to the Ready Room. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to join us tonight. I had a little snafu with the uh, with the different programs I use. Obviously, I'm max performed at all times when it comes to technology. So, uh, yeah, for, for what it is, Wombat, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I love being on this show. <laughs> uh, I don't see it showing up on your YouTube, by the way, so maybe I'm it should. It should be on there. Uh, I can double check here really quick. Yeah. What should it be under? Videos? Or no, it should be. Oh, it's we're live, dude. We're live. It's good. Oh, it is there. Used to be. Whoa, hold on. I need to. I want to mute this because I want to see comments. If, if we get anybody now, like I said, I advertise it on the regular YouTube program. I told you. I put this out to all my people. All my people. <laughs> so you can play. My mom and dad are watching. Hey, Blake, thanks, dude. Um, dude, hey, we got somebody on. Thanks, Blake. Pre Blake is already lying to us about us looking solid, which is All great. Right. So that's awesome. Well, uh, hey, <clears throat> um, regardless, this will be published for anybody who wants to watch it. Mainly my kid. Uh, maybe one day learn about his dad and one of his best friends. But Wombat, I wanted to open it up with. It's been a crazy week, man. Uh, we had a hero or a legend in naval aviation pass away yeah. this week. Um, and not to be a Debbie Downer, but like literally like a couple hours ago, I got word that a childhood friend of mine uh, passed away. So that's sad. I'm sorry. That's so sad. yeah, thanks, man. But way to hit me with that live on the interwebs, by the way. Like, we, well, just so everybody knows, we, we talked for like five minutes before it was over. <laughs> but we're going to talk about, and that would have been a wonderful time for Gonky to tell me that. But I'm well, it's outside the, scope, <laughs> outside the scope of the ready room a little bit, but well, I won't throw it in there uh, just because, you know, I mean, I, childhood childhood friends, right? I mean, it kind of sucks. Yeah, but, yeah absolutely. But uh, but hey, man, what, what about, what did you know about Snort, man? How <clears throat> I can sum up Snort very simply by saying, Every time I tried to do a flyby of a ship in any <laughs> aircraft, any aircraft carrier from the E-2 to the Hornet T-45, the last thought I had before I went for it was his Tomcat pass. Yeah, not and as good as the first Snort. thought that I had after I finished was that I did flybys a disservice compared to it. Yeah, you know, like I obviously Snort was before our time, so I actually – uh, as I mentioned before, like I always wanted to fly a Tomcat. Uh, You've said that a time or two. Yeah. Tomcats. So yeah. I always wanted to fly a Tomcat. Uh, Wombat and I were actually in flight school in like the pipeline, like the sure. jet pipeline when they closed and they closed it early they did. Uh, when they closed down the Tomcat rag. So literally two classes ahead of me was the last of the Tomcat guys. I'm not saying I, know, I was good enough to fly it, but I don't think anybody's saying that, um, but <laughs> but I do remember vividly the day they closed it. To yeah. this day. it's almost twenty years later, and uh, um, Yankee. Uh, we're talking about snort snodgrass. But yeah. I saw a comment. Uh, I remember the day in Kingsville. We were roommates, and I remember the day you came home, and you looked <laughs> like I backed over your dog leaving the house. Like, you were just distraught. Yeah. I thought something happened at the squadron, and I'm like, you know, here I am. I'm just a nobody E2 guy trying to survive. We've talked about it on past videos, right? I, I don't even remember what phase of just being railroaded in the training I was at in my life. We were in survival phase. Yeah, I was in, well, that was, it's always survival phase. And I remember you coming home and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And you're like, I can't get Tomcats. And, and I, for a brief second before my friendship kicked in, I was like, let me play you the world's smallest violin. <laughs> I'm getting upset about that. That's because I'm like, dude, you're still going to go fly. Like, oh, I'm sorry. You're going to have to go fly the Hornet. That's horrible. Yeah, jet guy uh, problems, right? Yeah. I just failed another flight and they're trying to kick me out. But whatever. So I do remember vividly how passionate you were about. That was uh, the dream. But so, 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 like, even before I, 
before I was even a Navy pilot, like I was just a young guy growing up, I read a whole, all the, you know, all the aircraft carrier books and Tomcat and, you know, his story is in there. And he's, so he was one of the first, so he got uh, winged in, I think, 73. And so he was one of the first guys uh, to fly. So he basically flew it from the start. So I think 74 to when he retired, which was pretty close to the end uh, yeah. of the Tomcat run. And I, I read he had 4,800 hours uh, in that airplane, which if you have a thousand hours in a fighter, like you're, you're, you're a high time guy. You if know? you have a thousand hours in anything around the ship, you're a high time guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he yeah. had 4,800 4, hours. And uh, I, if you guys, if you guys care at all about the Tomcat, you know, Ward, uh, a guy named Ward Carroll has a really good YouTube channel. He was a Tomcat Rio and he did a really good thing about snort snorts life, which I listened to it today. Um, cause you know, he's kind of a, uh, you know, he's just somebody that we, we all Navy, naval aviators, um, we, you know, we all knew of him and whether you like the guy or not, you know, I guess some I aspire to at least being able to do the flybys that he did, but the guy, like he put the lantern pod on the Tomcat, you know, which made it, uh, you know, the, the strike aircraft it was. And I mean, he, he did do a lot of, a lot of good things. And then of Absolutely. course, you know, the air show stuff after it. So sure. But he died doing what he loved, right? I mean, isn't that what they say? Isn't that what we all? Uh, I don't know. It, it sucks. It, there's yeah. no good way about it. You lose a warrior like that. Yeah. You just only hope that you know his life touched those around him, which I think it did. I think talking about it here is a tribute. You've got two washed-up Navy pilots <laughs> that, that were very affected um, by his uh, his flyby. If nothing else, that one snap. That yeah. One photo. I mean, epic. that was everything I <laughs> wanted naval aviation to be, and tried to make it. Frankly, they, they didn't um, even beat that shot in the movie Top Gun. Like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't. I mean, you no. And if you're a young Navy pilot or in flight school now, don't try to. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> because it's a different world. You will be kicked out so quick. Well, well, Matt, you bring up a good point, man. So, like it. You know, because all pilots, especially fighter pilots, like to, we call it, you know, sport bitching. Um, you know, that guy, I would put him there with kind of like, you know, your Robin Oles, you know, your Duke Cunningham, your Chuck Yeagers, like those those guys, man, today, they would, they get washed out. Like, there's no, there's no, unfortunately, there's no room for that warrior you know, I mean, some guys I know did not like snort. Which I don't sure, know. there's no. You you realize, and I say this all the time to people, that there is one person that I know in the military and in naval aviation that I have never met somebody who doesn't like them. Yeah, and that's you. <laughs> You're the only person. If somebody ever came up to me and was like, "Oh, gonky." I don't know about that guy. I would immediately write that person off. For <laughs> well, thank you for that. Because because nobody. Now, I guarantee you, and I hope they come into this chat room because it would be fun to talk to them. There are plenty of Wombat haters. And not only have my haters, they go across different platforms, <laughs> yeah. different genres, everything. Apparently, there's some in, in, uh, in reading and books now, which is nice that I branched out to that. But um, – yeah, I mean, there's always, to me, if you've really made a difference, and I'm not saying you haven't, but you're going to have people that are like, oh, that guy. And most of the time, it's because they were jealous. And I'm not saying people are jealous of me. I'm saying people were jealous of story. Yeah. They couldn't hack it. And yeah, did he always do everything perfect? Of course not. We, none of us do. That's an ir It's You cannot keep up to that standard. But well, the fact that there are haters of snort. Yeah, you're always going to have your haters. And like... Sure. It's funny. Uh, I didn't realize it, man. Because I mean, my God, we're getting old. But apparently, he was in his seventies. Keep yourself. I feel great. <laughs> Dude, he was in his seventies, man, and he was still flying tactical airplanes. I mean, I'm in my forties, and I'm like, dude, my back hurts, my neck hurts. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that kind twist of the muscle driving my truck to work. Like, <laughs> right. And the guy, you know, uh, you know, passion or just natural. I mean, the guy is just drawn to it, right? So. And, uh, you know, Ward Carroll brought up a good point. I, like I said, I never knew him, but Ward Carroll did. And, uh, you know, he's like, you know, I could, he said, I couldn't imagine the guy going out slowly with like cancer or something. It's like, that's no, how, no. 
you know, that, God, that would be the worst yeah. possible death for that warrior. He yeah. died a warrior's death. I mean, that's ultimate, right? I mean, that's, they talk about this and it's, it's always attached to the ground guys. And I'm not taking anything away from, you know, the special ops and the seals and, and all that. They're amazing. Uh, have the utmost of respect, right? Yeah. But the warrior death, the dying in combat is always yeah. attached to them. It's not really attached to aviators anymore because we haven't fought that kind of war. Yeah. For Snort to go out dealing with, you know, colon cancer or something. Yeah. Been, yeah. First of all, it wouldn't have killed him because the guy was invincible. I mean, ultimately, <laughs> right? So he would have just laughed at it and pressed through. But it just would have been, that's not how he would have wanted to go. And, yeah. um, you know, I think truly everything I've read about the guy and heard about the guy and people I've talked to that knew him, he would have rather had died in combat in a Tomcat yeah. than in the plane he did. But for a guy in his 70s, that's the closest you can get. And we yeah. just have to honor that memory. So, Yeah, so it sucks. But, you know, I guess that's life. We got a couple. Uh, Snort was also an LSO, which kind of leads me into the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about today. Because Wombat is an LSO. And I, I truly think. You know, the whole, you talk about carrier aviation, you know, Snodgrass doing these crazy high speed passes. And it's just like, I just, I just think so much of the old, old stuff's going away. And I think maybe even ball flying. Oh, it is for sure. It's sure. going away. And I kind of want, just want to talk to you about it while I'm bad. So mainly, you know, as I get old and have dementia and lose my mind, I can maybe watch this and kind of be like, oh yeah, that's how, that's how we used to do it. Next week. That's right. That's right. You tune back in to remember what we talked about. That's right. We had a couple. Uh, uh, we got a couple comments here. I just kind of go through some of the. Um. So I can't pronounce again the guy that's Trump. Trump. I can't remember. He says Snort would cheat in air combat. Good for him. It makes him better. That's a true statement. And <laughs> Wombat, Wombat and I will tell you we will cheat uh, every single time if possible. I'm going to cheat. Because if you're not cheating, you're not trying. That's the old fighter pilot saying. So, amen. Yeah, amen. Uh, let's see. Brandon says no, no, but the pilot that got the buzz the tower for Top Gun explained the funny head. Yeah, I saw sure. that. I think that guy's call sign was Bozo. That was, that was a pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, there it is, Bozo. Uh, Frank's like, I wonder how different the air war would have been in Vietnam if the Tomcat entered service just a bit earlier. They actually made it in the theater, <clears throat> but they didn't see any combat. Obviously it was the tail end of the conflict, but uh, who knows? I, I, I think like in any airplane, they probably had some growing pains when the thing was first introduced. So never fly the A model of anything, right? <laughs> yeah, right, dude. <laughs> Especially the first couple of years, right? Uh, Chris, I wonder how much has changed in Naval flight regs since the late eighties. All of it, <laughs> yeah. all of it. Yeah, Snort used to fly for Draken, that's true. How many air to air kills do you have? Are we talking All of birds, them. bugs? All of them. <laughs> so many birds. <laughs> so many. Yeah, so now me and Wombat, unfortunately, don't have any air to air kills. Um, there hasn't been too many in the last, well, 40 years or so. So uh, cool. We got somebody from Malaysia on here. Uh, nice. Paul, thanks for the, the book shout out. Sequel's coming. I appreciate that you like it. Yeah. So Wombat. So Snort was an LSO. You were an LSO. Clearly, you've got to be a popular guy to be an LSO and it no bearing on skill whatsoever. Would you say that's a true statement? Uh, sure. I think it takes a certain personality. That's what it takes. Yeah. So, you know, an LSO landing signal officer, like I – I wasn't popular enough to actually be a, a landing signal officer, but in the Navy, it's a big deal uh, to be one, right? Because you guys stand some extra watches, don't you? You do, and it's different. So I experienced it in both the E-2 and the Hornet, and the Hornet community handles it differently than the E-2 community. So What was uh, different? Well, in the E-2, it was my watch. Okay. We had more air crews. The LSOs would never ride the desk and have to sit squadron duty officer at sea. Right. Our LSO day was our duty day. In the Hornet, especially single seat world, you know, there's not that many extras. So 
just because you were an LSO, you were likely also a standing squadron duty officer. Except, yeah, so. I call it special treatment because they, you know, like, oh, we'll walk all day in our float coat, but it's a lot of walking. I mean, <laughs> nowadays, I'm sure every LSO out there is uh, is is counting their steps. They're probably yeah, Fitbits and all sorts of stuff or whatever kids do. Um, and they're probably getting a ton of miles in, but you do, you walk the length of the ship 12 to 14 times a day. So, um, so what, so, okay. So here, <laughs> so if mover was on here or any other air force guy, they get all huffy puffy about it, but the whole, what separates. How is mover not on here? I fully expected uh, it. To be I don't want to follow. <laughs> So what differentiates Air Force fighter pilots right from Navy fighter pilots is landing on landing on the carrier, right? So obviously in the in Navy training, and this is the part where that kind of perplexes me because I heard they're thinking about getting rid of the entire CQ phase, uh, uh, the entire CQ phase in T-45s. Sorry, the comment was hilarious. <laughs> It's the world's best <laughs> Reno. That is a that's <laughs> that's, that's that's the only way Mover could make it onto the ship is uh, as a Rio or Wizzo. <laughs> wow. <laughs> your YouTube channel's gonna get shut down. He is your IT. Is that hate speech? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. No. No, so I mean that's right. So so Wombat, what would you say in T forty fives? I would say a solid I would say a solid 20% of the training is boat focused. Sure. That's fair. Uh, for a strike guy, absolutely. Uh, for an E2C2 pilot, I'd say it's, it's, it's an even higher percentage. Mainly because, you know, you don't do the whole WEPs, bombs, you know, air to air, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's easily for your typical Hornet, Super Hornet pilot going through, I guess it's mainly Super Hornet pilots, if not all Super Hornet pilots now. Um, 20% is the boat and it's usually towards the end um, yeah. or, or frankly, it's, it is the end. Um, that was one of the greatest things, you know, my last job in Meridian was wing LSO and I got to soft patch a lot of guys and that's super fun. I mean, yeah, that was, that was, that was pretty darn rewarding. And, uh, and it, it brought back my carrier quals every time, right. every time. Well, we did it. I think you did it as well, right? In T-45s, we did mid-phase FCLPs, right? Mm -hmm. Field carrier landing practice. And then before we went to the ship, we did FCLPs, yep. carrier landing practice. I mean, and it was literally days and nights of just flying around. We called it bouncing, right? Because as soon as you touch down, you would take off again. So we spent like <laughs> days and tens of thousands of pounds of fuel just so much. burning laps around the... But you need it. Uh, it, um, you have to, you have to do that. You need that repetition because of the precision, right? So in the, so, I, so not to bash on air force guys or yeah, whatever, can. but you know, like Navy guys are taught to fly on speed. Typically air force guys are taught to fly airspeed, which I'm a firm believer in on speed. Uh, we know we had a couple of 35s crash, uh, they were Air Force dudes trying to land, you know, too fast. I don't, you know, if you're, it's going to be so obvious if you're 50 knots fast because you have lights <laughs> that tell you if you're on speed or not on speed. Again, I'm not bashing Air Force guys. They're awesome pilots. But, um, but as far as actually landing on the ship, I want to ask you as a, somebody who went to LSO school, just to like put some numbers to it. So like, it's basically... The, the hard part about it is, right, the, the ship is moving away from you. The angle deck means that you're constantly doing a lineup correction. And what is the window, man? What is the window that you're trying to bring a, bring an airplane through? It's you, regardless of the aircraft, because we change the lens setting per aircraft, right? So every, every plane that comes across the ramp, the back of the ship, has a hook to ramp uh, and a hook to eye. Um, we try to theoretically, regardless of the aircraft, the distance between the, the tail hook and the ramp should be the exact same. Regardless okay, right. Of right. And to do that, planes are different lengths, right? You sit differently. I mean, remember the prowlers, those poor guys sat so high in that thing and <laughs> it, it looked ridiculous. So they have to change the lens setting so that you're on the same glide slope, essentially, based on where you sit. 
All of that is to be said, if you fly a perfect pass on speed, on glide slope, on center line, you are trying to have your hook touch down in a one square foot box. Yeah. On a moving ship that the landing area is constantly moving slightly to your right and pitching deck and the different winds because some slow ship driver thinks it's a good idea to turn five degrees to get one more not a wind, which you could care less about in your plane. Um, yeah, one square foot is the perfect spot. So how from, and I know a lot of the ships now have, well, not a lot of them, but the newer ships are ha have three wires, but like sure. what is what is the length of the LA on the ship? Do you know, is it like 300? I don't feet? remember it uh, specifically. I want to say something like 800 feet total. Maybe. Oh, yeah, that's, that's total. Yeah, total from ramp to the end of the round on. Maybe. But I'm saying like the distance between the four, the one and the four. Oh, geez, I'd have to look it up, honestly. Um, I want to say it's something around 20 foot ish between wire or something yeah. like that. If that, it may be. Uh, you're in a very small window. I mean, you, you just, you are. There's not, uh, because there's so many other variables happening at all times, right? I mean, and, and I mean, that's on a perfect day. You think, okay, well, if I practice hundreds and hundreds of times, sure, I'll get good enough that I can put this tail hook touching down on this one square foot piece of deck. And what I'll tell you is that one square foot piece of deck is probably the nicest square foot piece of deck because it never gets hit. I mean, it's the least touched of all of them. So, Not by me. I don't touch it. No, I know. Uh, well aware. Which might go back to why you weren't in an LSO. <laughs> That's true. But you know, I do remember a wise fighter pilot once told me, you're either good at landing on the ship or good at tanking. <laughs> I can't remember who said that. But, um, so, yeah, it it is uh, – it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, and then you add things like, you know, when you and I went to uh, – to T-45s, the C state had to be damn near perfect. I mean, right. you, you're, this is no kidding. As a wing LSO, if the, C, if the C state got more than two foot, we had to stop. Right. That is not the case in the fleet. <laughs> at <all>. No, <laughs> no, no, it's not. But you know, so like a lot of the, so where I'm at now, I fly with a lot of lieutenants and they're just, cause I'm the token Navy guy, right? So they're curious, they always ask me about you know, what's it like to land on the ship? That's what everyone wants, wants to know about. But I, I honestly think, you know, the part that's never talked about that is really crazy is during day case one, the entire operation launch and recovery is calm out. Yep. The only thing you hear is tower paddles, radio check. That's it. The, it. Like the entire thing is calm out. It's this choreographed. Everyone has their altitudes. It's all timing. So, you know, the guy in low holding is hawking the deck and he knows about how many seconds, you know, for the jets to launch. And I mean, it's a, it's, it's really an art form and it. Like, I just think it takes a tremendous amount of skill to be good at it. Like I was never good at it. I could do it, but I was never like, there were some guys, especially the older guys that were just really good at it. You know, the guys that could, that could break the deck, which that means, I mean, completely calm out. Somebody has hawked the deck and saw, okay, if I come out of low holding right now, three miles out, come back into the break, as I'm rolling into the groove, they're going to open the deck for, for recovery. And it's like, I mean, you're talking a window of seconds because what, what's the interval that you guys – 45 seconds. From <laughs> yeah, so the interval is 45 seconds per trap. Yeah. You know, so like there's, a, there's an entire other spectrum of just boat flying that – you guys, I mean, I know you guys share that responsibility probably with the air boss and stuff, but sure. well, I mean, if you don't do all that first stuff correct, you're never going to arrive on the ball like where you need to be. Yeah. And then the pinnacle is, like you said, trying to hit this one square foot. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, in LSO school, man, so you went to LSO school. I mean, what do they really – I, I imagine that obviously it's like we got to get these guys on on deck without killing them. But what's I mean, what are they? Is there anything they really harp on? Is there anything like when you went to LSO school, you're like, wow, that's pretty crazy. Um, the amount that they spent on case studies of accidents and what went wrong and when it was pilot error, vice when it was LSO error, vice when there was some external factor, um, and and just the. So it looks like when you see it in movies or, or even, I mean, as a non LSO, I know when you see us all standing out there, it just looks like 
five or six dudes or dudettes with their Oakley sunglasses on and uh, not wearing an ear protection and cool white float coats with nice tans. Um, but there's, <laughs> and it, it is a lot of that, trust me. Um, but it's, they focus so much on LSO school about the role of each person. And, and that was something I had no idea. You know, even when I started rushing, if you will, being in LSO on my first deployment, standing up there watching these recoveries, I didn't realize, you know, you spoke about it, the, the choreographedness of carrier aviation, right? I mean, a launch, a recovery with, with no comms, and it goes all the way down to the flight deck guys and all the you know, enlisted guys busting their butts and girls busting their butts, you know, on the flight deck in, in 120 degree heat all day long, lugging chains. And um, you go through all that, right? And now you go one layer bigger and it's all of us flying around the ship making this happen. And then go one layer bigger, you have these LSOs down there that there's usually five on a team, five to six, and they each have a role um, that's, that's critical. I even touched upon it in the book as kind of a joke, but um, kind of an homage to, to LSOs where uh, Rattler goes up and, and one of the young guys is, is up there and he's just mesmerized watching these planes. Cause I mean, there's nothing, I don't, I don't care your background. You're standing feet away from a, an, a landing aircraft. Like you don't get to do that, let alone the types of aircraft. Uh, so it's really easy for everybody on that to be just fixated looking back at the plane. And there's one guy whose whole job is to look forward. And it's funny because you'll see pictures of LSOs and you're like, what? That guy looks like he's not doing anything. He looks like he's just kind of wow. dazed off. He's making sure the landing area stays clear because we on the port side of the ship, if you will, uh, we're that barrier. If yeah. somebody runs out there and it's happened, um, I remember one of my buddies was an LSO on another carrier and at night, just out of the corner of his eye, that was his job. And a guy ran out and he screamed a wave off and they waved the plane off and it missed the hitting a guy by feet. I mean, just went right over the top. So there's so many critical roles. Um, it, it's, it's, that was really what struck me. And then one step further, we start talking about Movilis, which I really had no concept of what Movilis is, which for people- What is Movilis? It's the manual. Uh, version of this lens. Yeah. And to me, and they would do simulators with that where we would basically, we would, we would practice landing planes with Mobilis. And so, so get look real quick. So the lens we talk about the Fresno lens, right? I don't know who designed it, but basically if you're in an airplane and you are on the proper glide slope, you will see uh, basically a ball and sure. the ball the ball there's a, a row of lights that's fixed which is a datum point and mm -hmm. based on where you're at in the glide slope the ball will rise or go below the datum below the datum is bad you add power above it right you're a little high so that's what wombat's talking about and when the sea state gets so gnarly or if the fresno lens breaks sure they bring out the uh the movilis and lso's and manually control it now wombat where's fresno lens normally at Left okay. side when you're landing about a third, two thirds, halfway Were down. Were you mobilist on the right? <laughs> I have. <laughs> we had to. Uh, not, if it's not that hard, let's just put it over here. <laughs> so um, as one of our deployments, they somebody, a fine leader, if you will. Anybody who's read the book knows I care about leadership. A fine leader uh, decided we should rig station three, which yeah. is on the opposite side. And we we're only gonna bring down our best pilots to see if we can do it. Um, and the answer was no, we can't. Every one of them waved off. They derigged it. We moved over to the other side. They set up the regular lines. And yeah, it was crazy, dude. I, it was I, I only heard of it, but like I was the guy that was like, I was just barely a naval aviator, you know what I'm saying? Like, if they moved the ball to the right, oh. my little brain just couldn't couldn't handle well, and, it. And think about it from a standpoint of, like, a Hawkeye. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're looking cross-cockpit. Like, I mean, it just it, – it's – I get it. I get why we have to have it. It's a combat ship, right? Yeah. Um, if you sustain battle damage and that whole side of the ship's gone, right. you got to have an option. But it was it was ridiculous. Yeah. So like you said, man, there's a whole team on the LSO and I imagine it's CAG Paddles who's the team leader, right? 
Uh, well, actually, no. The team leader was the most senior uh, junior officer, which sounds weird, senior J.O. Uh, and then CAD Pebbles really just supervised everything. But um, as I worked up through my field qual and squadron qual and eventually towards my wing qual, I became a team leader where you're in charge of these. Uh, you know, it was either five or six people, yeah. depending on the manning and all that. And you would set up the rotations of who is doing what and all these things and made sure the training was getting done and made sure all the passes got debriefed and all of them got put in the computer. And, you know, so you were kind of managing that because ultimately you would finish that tour and become a wing qual, which then could go on to either the FRS um, or T45s and teach students. So that's essentially what you're working for. So, right. Um, you know, well, <laughs> I mean, like you said, there's a whole team of guys out there doing it. And so as a guy, as a new guy in the fleet, you know, this is before I even attempted at being an LSO. But, you know, we were always taught, you know, hey, listen, uh, you know, you trap, you land, you know, you run down, take off your flight gear, you're doing paperwork for the airplane and maintenance. And at about that time, you know, the LSOs. Angels in white, if you will. <laughs> Fine. That there, once the recovery is done, they come down and they they literally walk the length of the ship to each ready room. So I was taught as a new guy, I'll never forget, like the LSOs in my squadron were like, listen, dude, whatever whatever is going on, if you're doing airplane maintenance, if you're debriefing somebody, if you're, you know, whatever, you need to stop what you're doing, stand up, take your graded pass like a man. Or a woman. Right. <clears throat> Don't get, don't bitch about it. Don't complain. Don't argue. Just tell them thanks, paddles, and move on with your day. I mean, they were like, literally, if you do anything other than that, if you disrespect this squadron by arguing with, uh, you know, the the guys that are that are taking, you know, you know, taking the the weight of keeping you off the back of the ship, like there's going to be problems. So it was very serious. That's how I always was, even though. I didn't always agree with the past. Although most of the time I caught the one wire, so there's really no arguing, but, but, uh, but it was our close, slow the ramp, one wire. Easy. <laughs> yeah. Easy. But, you know, literally that sets the tone <clears throat> for the importance of the job. And like, you know, I didn't really, you know, in training. So in T45 and even in the rag, you just do CQ, which mm -hmm. CQ is a lot different than what we would call cyclic ops. Sure. Now, from an LSO standpoint, is it that different, CQ and cyclic? No, other than um, CQ is is tedious and it's it's just it's long, you know. But on the so you know it's it's kind of a it's a double edged sword, right? So in CQ, your pilots are CQing, right? So right. they're they're getting their qualification back. Carrier qual is what CQ stands for. Getting your carrier qual. Carrier qual, yeah. Um, so you're getting that you're either you're either re-CQing or you are doing your initial qual. Um, so you don't have the experience as much or maybe you're not as proficient, but you've been practicing a ton. Right. Then you get to cyclic ops. You're not doing those landings. Right. It's just whatever you go fly. And oh, by the way, in naval aviation, that's just an afterthought. It's admin. Right. I mean, you you are expected to know. <laughs> how to come back aboard the ship, whether it's day, night, good weather, bad weather, it doesn't matter, period. That's one and done. Do that. Like one and done, right? That's it. Get aboard. I mean, that was do not embarrass the squadron. Do not embarrass the ship. Just get aboard. Stay below the radar. Don't <laughs> highlight yourself. Take your licks from the LSO when they come and be done with it. And, and so it's very different, but you're very proficient when you're out on a deployment because you're doing it all the time. So, um, I mean, frankly, every day off and landing for a Navy guy when they're on deployment is, is that. So yeah. it's different. You know, there's a lot of similarities, but, you know, you're, you're more keyed up doing CQ. You're watching the pilots because they haven't been doing it or it's their first qual. So they can easily, um, right. easily throw you a bad pass. But, you know, that's that complacency out of the ship. And, and there's a story that I talk about. Um, where it's a beautiful clear day. It was one of the last times I was waving as an E2 pilot because um, we were almost done with our deployment. We were going home. I knew I wasn't doing another deployment because we had some time down. And beautiful clear day. And I was a team lead at this time. And, and as a team lead, you don't spend as much time 
as the controlling LSO. You're usually on the backup, overseeing the whole thing, overseeing center line control, things like that. Um, so here comes, right, beautiful, clear, case one day, gorgeous, 12 planes, all hornets, baby hornets to recover. Every one of them comes across with damn near a perfect pass. And the last guy, everybody, I mean, the guys are packing it up and I'm controlling because I wanted to. And the last guy comes across the ring or comes into the groove, looks perfect. And all of a sudden, I mean, just something about his jet just did not look right. I waved him off. He barely missed the ramp. I mean, his hook taught, I mean, we, we went out and measured. His hook was within three foot of the ramp when it hit. Because you know how the horn it is. I mean, you get behind on the power, or you're behind on the power. You're done. He bolted, <laughs> he went around, he came back, he landed fine. We went downstairs to grade the passes. I literally, it was like a scene from a movie. He just walked up and hugged me. He's like, you saved my life. He's like, I don't know what happened. I got behind the plane. It's that complacency in cyclic ops, which was really yeah. scary because that's where you get guys running across the landing area. That's where you get things like that. And, and you know. Do you coming off a week? Coming off a one week port call, right? Oh my God. Port calls were the worst. <laughs> the <laughs> <First day>. worst. <laughs> worst. It was the wild west out there, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was. Whew. And, it, and oh, by the way, the LSOs were in port with you. <laughs> Well, yeah. So they're hurting yeah. too. <laughs> so like, like one bad saying, like it's, you know, like you expected to go out and do this. Right. So like I, the longest mission I did in the F-18 was like almost eight and a half hours. Right. So, I mean, I come back at like two in the morning. I took off as daylight. I come back like eight and a half hours later. It's, it's two in the morning. I've been strapped in the seat for a long time and like, I'm tired hungry i'm angry like, you know, like yeah. but you gotta like you've got to like super focus and that's case three at night right so now you're flying a choreographed entirely different pattern but it's at night it's not calm out it's very controlled but at the same right. time it's it's all about timing right they give you a push timing so you got to do this little math problem in your jet so you put you know you tip over to come down uh downhill at the right time at the right speed um but you know, for us, man, for concentration purposes, they actually had a program where you could get drugs <laughs> to help I'm you. Well aware. Well right. Aware. So they're like, hey, listen, guys, you know, here's your speed. Here's your speed pill for getting Uppers this. and downers. Yeah. And then as soon as you land, you know, as you're eating your midnight cheeseburger, take the downer so you can sleep. Um, so there was... I would say that I, I would say half the guys in our air wing were doing. I never did it because I was afraid, honestly, Juan. But I would like it. <laughs> sure, agreed, agreed. But a, a lot of guys do it because it's the only way they get any rest. You're so amped up. Yeah. When you land, I don't care if it's the most beautiful, literally the most beautiful pass at night. You can't calm down from that. If you can, there is something seriously wrong with you. Frankly, and you probably shouldn't be doing the job. Well, that's the other thing. You know, it's like everybody talked about how scary the night trap is. But guess what, dude? You trap, lights off, idle, you know, freaking crack the wings, get the nose wheel steering. Where's your director? Right, right, right. And now you're taxiing and you can't see because it's dark. And, I mean, it's like you got you're trying to get out of the way because your buddy is behind you. 45 seconds, you don't want to wave him off, right? So, yep. like, there's like a – there's – all kinds of stuff going on. And like, when you finally park the airplane, I'm sure you're the same way. You may nice, but like my, my boots are shaking on the runner. I was like, what the heck is wrong with me, dude? Everybody has a different thing. Um, mine was my, my quads. Like they were just spasm and I could not stop shaking my legs. It was just like this adrenaline dump. And you know, you, you talk to the, the flight doc about it and all that. And it's like, yeah, that's your thing. Some guys have eye twitches. Some people stutter afterwards. I mean, all sorts of weird stuff. You're, we did a study. It was actually really, uh, really kind of cool. Um, I wore a heart rate monitor for uh, a flight in the E2. And, uh, and it was interesting looking back at the graph on how high your heart rate would spike at certain points of the flight. Like, like it was fine. It was a baseline. It was resting. No big deal. And it was like, as I taxied over the JBD, it went up, you know, as I go into tension, it goes up. Right. I mean, just these huge spikes oh, yeah. and then 10 seconds off the bow, it's fine again. 
you know, and same yeah. thing from the back. It was so bizarre what, what we just every day and every night would put our bodies through. And maybe that's. Did you <laughs> want that? Did you read the flight schedule from the bottom up? Like I did. Like I used to. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I think Navy guys are the only guys. Cause it's like the, you know, the night land, even though you have the LSO, LSOs there to help you, man, accidents still happen. Right. I mean, yeah. they had the Prowler land on the S3. The Hornet took off the S3's tail. They've had countless this. And right. One that is there's a point where you even if you try to wave the guy off, he's still going to hit the ship. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's definitely wave off windows, um, various wave off windows. And and yeah, it is what it is. Uh, there's there's you try your best and that wave off window changes, you know, as you get in different operations, if the deck's moving, things like that. But yeah, there's only so much you can do. And um, yeah, I mean, there's some scary passes. I mean, I have a buddy who took his wingtip of an E2 through the tail of two Super Hornets on a bolter. Um, a mutual friend of you and I, we went to flight school with, uh, pitching deck and they waved him off way too late. They, they should have just let him hit the deck and go back airborne, they didn't. There was an amazing photo of this VFA 41 Super Hornet that was full blower, missed the deck completely, and went like ahead of the landing area on the wave off. Yeah. And you see this, it was one of our maintenance guys snapped the photo. It's a side shot of the, well, I guess this way, the F-18, and you see the landing area and the blower comes out and wraps around the landing area like he oh, was within wow. like a foot of his burner cans hitting and if that happened they would have all died because it would have pitched the plane down um and i talked to him after and i'm like well what'd you think man and he's like i just remember being full afterburner full half stick and seeing water in the mirrors and that was it and he's like i thought i was just waiting for my wizard to punch us out <laughs> And I was like, but they didn't. He's like, yeah. So there you go. Is there one well, Is there a time the LSO LSO saved your life? Uh, yeah, the uh, prologue of the book. So I've said it before. Prologue of the book is the one part I'll tell you is a true story, and the LSO saved me 100 percent that night. Um, there's been other times for sure, but that night, um, uh, the the CAG paddles and and my squadron LSO is the only reason I'm here. Frankly, I mean, their calls are what kept my scan moving. If, as you know, you know, behind the ship, it's all about keeping your scan moving. And I had totally fixated based on what I was dealing with. And yeah. So those guys and dumb luck um, was, yeah. Yeah, man, for me, I, you know, even though I joke about LSOs uh, in a popularity club, but when I was brand new in the fleet, you know, I'd see cute. I passed. I thought I was salty. I went back to the ship as a fleet guy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, long story short, I ended up breaking the main gear on a Hornet <laughs> and it was, you know, pitch and deck big time, which I'd never seen before. And, uh, Ken paddles, uh, you know, was, was basically talking me down. And I mean, I just, dude, I, cr they had to tow me out of the LA, <laughs> they had to tow me out of the landing area with a tractor. It was definitely the hardest landing I've ever, I did two of them. Actually, the first one, when I broke the gear, dude, I bounced over all the wires nice um and they brought me back around again and thank god i caught a wire but that they definitely kept me i was all over the place dude I, I was i was like deer in the headlights like i could only imagine you know my career is was was interesting because i was multi-crew initially yeah. right so you get a lot of experience dude i could only imagine what being in real pitching deck the first time and alone Oh, There's no way. Man. I mean, I, I still vividly, you know, we can call it dreams. Uh, they're nightmares. But we can call it dreams. Right. Why not? But um, I still vividly remember my first fleet landing um, because we were at like six miles behind the Nimitz. And it was beautiful, clear night, huge moon, which is horrible for night landing because yeah. you spot the deck and they were doing a FOD walk down. Um, so they turn all the lights on on the flight deck to include, you know, the 68 on the side and all this stuff. And here I am in my stupid Hawkeye flying our rudimentary instruments down on this ILS, ACLS landing. And uh, I look up to see the ship and I see the ship do this huge roll and I can see the 68 on the one side of the island. And I'm like, I've never seen that. And then it, I watch it 
roll again so I could see the 68 on the other side. And, and I was flying with the maintenance officer. who was a phenomenal pilot. And, uh, and I'm like, I'm like, did you see that? And I just remember like him looking at me and these big eyes and he's like, why your instruments? You know, cause he knew I needed to, to focus on that, but oh man, I, there's no way. Like, um, but you just, you, you do it. You know what I mean? Like you don't have a choice. What's well, you, yeah, option? you know how it is, man. You're like, well, I don't want the entire air wing to be like, mm-hmm, gonkies, this is, you, know, you can't handle it or whatever. So there's like, I would rather do my mentality is I'd rather die. Then yep. I mean, I, yep. I'm not just saying, like I would rather die than fail. That was my intent. I honestly think that's one of the things you know. You, you you watch a lot. You know now everybody's on YouTube. Everybody's doing podcasts. Everybody's talking about everything, which I think is good. I really do. I think it's our generation's way of of letting things kind of be categorized and and be there for the future. But it also lets people get it out. You know what I mean? Previous generations, you know, the talking was done at the O Club or whatever. And and one thing that I think ties us to all of those cool, sexy Hollywood special forces, you know, they, they love SEALs. They love all that, which they should. I mean, those guys do amazing work. Is that exactly what you said of the I would rather die than fail? Yeah. And I can't I mean, every flight was that way where it was like. I I don't want the bolter over my the bolt over my chair. I don't want that visibility. I don't want to be the guy that the LSO comes to and is like, we need to talk. Oh, right. <laughs> like I don't want to break the jet. Luckily, when I first started out, I was flying a Grumman and those things. God right. bless Grumman. I mean, they're flying tanks. I've landed the E2 on the nose gear first. Fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the thing is amazing. Um well, yeah, it's just that mentality of like, I, I would rather die because at least if I die, I don't have to deal with the failure. <laughs> well, okay. I kind of want to, you know, <clears throat> I kind of want to, you know, we talked about the Navy is talking about getting rid of CQ in the training phase. And that's because, and this is before, this is after our time. <clears throat> and I've talked to guys that have flown it, but like magic carpet. And then <clears throat> let's be honest, you know, Boeing is perfecting the carrier drone. Sure. And, I've got a good buddy who's on that program, you know, and he brings up a good point. He's like, dude, you know, give that thing a year or two of perfect three wires, every pass, every time in any C state. And they're going to be like, well, dude, why don't we just like make the airplanes land by themselves? Like, why are we having the guys do it? Why do we have NFOs in the back of an E2 airborne? We can just do it from the ship. Well, yeah. Listen, I'm just I'm just playing devil's advocate. So, I'm, and you I, know, like I Magic agree. Carpet, my buddies who flew Magic Carpet, are like, oh, dude, it's brainless now. You put in like the speed of the ship exactly, and then you, it just like it just holds you on glide slope. Like it cuts your inputs in. I, I don't know the numbers. It's unbelievable. I did a simulator of it. It was the only thing I've flown it um, early on, and it is it's amazing the technology. It really is that eight and a half hour mm-hmm. flight you had. That's why we need magic carpet because you you don't have the mental acuity to land at that point. You're, or I mean, a story I tell is is I mean I got double vision once, right? We've talked yeah. about on our channel about all the polyps and all that. That was not a fun landing at yeah. all on the ship. I mean, <laughs> great time for the automation, but to completely go the route of automation is what scares me because. These things do great, and and technology is amazing. Don't get me wrong; I love technology. Um, Don't but it. it's going to fail. It's going to break. I mean, it, it just is. You are in such a hostile, nasty environment at sea. I mean, it just it, there's going to be times when the salt air and everything is just it's just going to break, and then I mean, if you don't have the training. I asked about and like my buddy who flew Magic Carpet quite a bit in the fleet. He's like, dude, he's like, it doesn't break. He's like, there is, I don't understand it fully, but he's like, it's super reliable. But I, I mean, I, I'm with you, dude. I'm with you, my bad. I, I think, I think there's issues, but, um, I mean, we had Auto Land in the Hornet. Like sure. I, actually, I tried it once, but like I, mi- you're supposed to like couple up to the ship, like when it's flat. I don't know. I missed the window basically to do it, but. You know, Auto Land would work pretty well. And I saw in one of the comments here, guys talking about auto throttles. So we had auto throttles uh, as well. 
an F-18 and, you know, I would use auto till about the ball call and I would click out and, you know, auto, you know, it, the, the whole thing with flying behind the ship is it's counterintuitive to like what you would learn in like a Cessna or an Air Force fighter pilot, right? So an Air Force guy is taught to change his flight path with pitch, right? Navy guy is taught to do it with the throttle because if you change your pitch, it changes that hook to ramp ratio that you talked about earlier. Yeah. Right. So if the, you know, so you need to hold the same attitude at all times. So, you know, that's where things like auto throttles did make it easier, but you know, I could, I could do manual passes, you know, uh, almost as well, to be honest, but, sure. but you know, the, the whole idea to me of getting rid of CQ, I, I don't know. I, this is how I know I'm becoming an old guy, but it's like, it's what makes, you know, naval aviation, like, I don't know, kick ass for, for lack of better words. Yeah. It's what sets us apart and the ability to be able to take that carrier and carrier battle group and air wing any, <laughs> at any moment um, yeah. and do it in any condition. Yeah. It's new technology, school. right? Old school. Yeah. I just spin the, I just, yeah, I don't know. You know, my son, when he gets older, I don't know, they probably won't. If he ever decides to try to become an aviator and ends up out there, you know, maybe they won't. Maybe he'll just come back to low holding, hit the land button, and all the planes will talk to themselves and figure it out. <laughs> You're assuming there's still people in the plane at that point. That's true. Then what's the point of having people in the airplane, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it is it is different. It's hard. You know, I, I think yeah. – Life changes. You have to adapt. You don't want to be that crusty old guy that, you know, back in the day, That's me. there is technology. Um, but, you know, when we start shrinking training, training, that's that's how I get spooled up, man. You know me. Yeah. I get on my soapbox with training. You know, you. My, my motto is you're going to pay for training one way or another. You're either going to pay for it in the training or you're going to pay for it in deaths and lawsuits. And um, That's why the old guys do, like, like Snodgrass. That's like, that's why those guys were so legendary because, you know, like the, the Tomcat dude, that thing was not nearly as automated and gucci up as a Hornet. So like, mm -hmm. you know, like there's no Hornet. Like I, I've had the Hornet, I've had the Super Hornet in a flat spin upside down, but you know what? I've never worried about engines flaming out. I knew they wouldn't. And I, I knew the airplane would come out of this thing. Yep. I you just put it where the arrow tells you to go and it'll figure itself out. Yeah, the software is so good. Like the airplane is so good, but like back then, the the pilots, the the you know the the stick actuator had to be had to be good. And if he wasn't, it was painfully obvious because he came back in a parachute or a body bag. You know, he probably never made it there in the first place. Or that, yeah, exactly. So I mean, the washout rate was much higher. You know, yeah. it's just it's just a different world. But I just hope, and I always hope that you know, hey, we can evolve, we can do technology, we can make things better, we can make things more lethal. But don't, you know, they used to tell us in flight school, right? And Atops is written in blood. Yeah. <laughs> don't wash that blood away. Like, still right. remember that because that's scary, man. I mean, we both lost really close friends. Yep. And, uh, it's scary. I, I hope it doesn't go that route. I really don't. But. Well, dude, we'll take it. We'll take some. We got <clears throat> some questions in the chat here. I'll scroll through pick out some of the good ones dude and then uh then we'll kind of wrap it up with stuff that we're that we're working on and sure. we're pretty funny comments uh <clears throat> let's see here uh i scrolled up too far oh boy uh technology paul asked did you ever think your landing was better than what was graded every time every time <laughs> every time every time and i wasn't also but <laughs> yeah maybe. They knew you listen, you know, you watch it. You had the, you had the, the plat cam, right? Oh yeah. Every pass was recorded. Graded. Yeah. You know, I mean, so Lance T says mover is the world's best Rio. So mover is <laughs> movers. <laughs> I, I can't even get mover to ride in the back seat of a T38 with me just for fun. I've been in, in the, in his trunk. There's no way he would do that. No. So he's definitely not the world's best. Uh, Rio. No. Um, let's see. Marshall Ryan. Hey, Gonky, one bad earned a flight slot in the Navy. I leave for OCS in a few weeks. Any advice? Hey, Marshall, congratulations. Congrats, man. Marshall. I saw that earlier. That's awesome. I hope he's still on there. That's, that's, yeah. Crazy. Uh, it's just, man, just, just for two years, just commit yourself. OCS is a game. It's not the real Navy. And just enjoy it because, like, no kidding, you know, obviously 
Wombat and I talk about the old days because they were they were a good time, even though it was challenging. So congratulations. That's awesome, man. My advice, <laughs> I talked about this. Uh, I think you listened to it, Gonky, when I did the Afterburn podcast. We talked about this. My advice is make it about the team. Don't make it about yourself and don't compete. The competition happens, but the person who competes to try to be the best is the guy everybody hates. <laughs> yeah, and Gonky true. could attest to that because he remembers – pasting up memory items in my dorm room at the Vance Air Force Base to try to get me through flight school. He didn't need to do that, but he was helping me out. And so so work together and just don't make it about yourself, man. Every day, just be happy to be doing it. And Tremendous opportunity. 100%. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you need to be a nerd to be a fighter pilot? No. Uh, there it's are, not back in the day. Maybe now. <laughs> there are nerds that are fire pilots, right? Well, sure. um, let's see. Uh, Frank, how do the nerves not get the best of you during your first trap? I'd be shit my pants. Uh, yeah, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> oh, that's, not, that's from Frank. Uh, they tell you, and I remember in T forty fives, like they flat out's like, listen, if you have a cold cat. So if the cat doesn't fire properly, like you're not going to know and you're probably going to die because you have yeah. no reference of what's normal. Right. So if you trap and the cable breaks, so like you're probably going to die because you're not going to know you're going to trundle off the end of the, the uh, landing area. You're out of the ejection envelope. You're going to die. So we were all like, okay, cool. <laughs> Let's go. The first one just has to be normal. <laughs> right. So, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I don't know, man. We got a lot of – there's some good conversations. Auto throttle <laughs> cheating, no. Uh, dude, this is a funny one. What's a typical pilot's wristwatch? Um, Brightling, obviously. Come on. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was in the day. Now it's probably an Apple watch. But, but Yeah, dude. You got my Brightling. I love my Brightling. Man, I always wore the – what are they, $60? Yeah, no, that's why you weren't a real pilot. So the key <laughs> – Brightling has way more to it than its history and its heritage of aviation. It shows that you make poor financial decisions, oh, yeah. right? You think about three seconds in front of your face. I mean, that's exactly what being a pilot is. So. Pretty much. I'm a pilot, check out my watch, right? So. And, it's, and they're big watches, right? So They are nice. I never got one. I do kind of regret that. You can still go. <laughs> uh let's see here um neil asked wombat what did wombat wombat flew uh hawkeyes and hornets so he's not super hornets somebody said super hornets so i was like oh no nothing super about a super hornet yeah i saw it here uh ils and acls so wombat correct me if i'm wrong but acls was a was a super precise ils is that right it's all it is really is an ils for the ship yeah well we remember we could downgrade so we yes, have you could, you could, but it was a more, so we called it different in the Hawkeye. We called it ACLS bullseye. Right. And bullseye, bullseye was the downgrade version, but yeah, everybody has a different term for it, but yes, it's like a, a super, super, super precise ILS. Yeah. Or a less precise ILS. Yeah. You always wanted ACLS to work. Yes. <laughs> and remember that ILS is hooked to a moving aircraft carrier. Right. <laughs> so, Turtle must have checked in late. What is LSO landing signal officer? Angel and White. Angel. <laughs> uh, man, there's a lot of stuff on here. Let's see. Uh, Brandon had a pilot in VFA 137. He thought she caught the wire but didn't power up, roll off the deck burner. Yeah, so that would be a cut pass. So if oh, you yeah. don't go at least military power as soon as your wheels touch the ground, you're getting the old Charlie pass, which is – Cut pass, by definition, is an unsafe deviation inside the wave off window. Right. Brandon's asking 903904, so that's the hard landing code. Um, Pretty sure your landing on that one was a gonky 905, I think, is what that is. It was its own code. Triple nines, baby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Frank, is there ever an uh, incident where someone got a wave off but tried to land anyways? Yeah, I imagine that's happened. It has. Uh, it happened on one of my deployments, and that pilot was grounded for a week by CAG. Yeah. Because he didn't yeah. listen to us. On the flip side, you never take your own wave off. Nope. You um, just keep it coming all the way to your death. If every one of us have a heart attack on the LSO platform, you're on your own, but you don't realize it. So yeah. 
so like I said, it's just, it's, it's counterintuitive to like, you know, like if you're a civilian pilot or an air force pilot, it's like, what, what do you mean you don't take your own wave off? Yeah, it is a, there is a trust bond between pilots and LSOs that as much as the banter goes back and forth and, and there's a, there's a lot of good natured or not so good natured ribbing, yeah. it's, it's important. Uh, I got asked here, what's my favorite missile I ever shot? I like the the uh, the aim nine mainly because it's the only live missile I ever shot. Um, I've seen I've been on the wing of guys who shot like Sparrow and Ram and stuff, but the the winder is just like a bottle rocket. It's kind of crazy, man. It just yeah. goes. And how about you, Wombat? What did you shoot? Uh, aim nines, aim one twenties, and JSAW. I dropped. Which, which one was your favorite? Uh, the nine. It was fun because it was yeah. just like a fire. Like it was. It was like Fourth of July. It was like. Like, yeah, man, no idea what <laughs> mine, but cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, we're at the hour mark. Um, <clears throat> I know God, time flies when you're talking about airplanes. I could probably do this all night. My wife would not be happy. Um, I kind of want to wrap it up on that with uh, with what what have you been up to? I know your your book is out. Uh, I have a signed copy of it, so I feel like one of these days I'll be able to eBay that bad boy and retire. It, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Are you working on a sequel? And is God? Uh, let's be honest. Let's just get it out in the open. Is there a sequel? <laughs> Rattler will be back. Uh, and for the fans, so will Sandy. I know Sandy was a lot of people's uh, favorite. So it's been interesting. Um, since we've talked, I, I have fans and haters now, which is fun. That's a fun part of this world. So if you like the book, please go make a nice review somewhere because it offsets uh, some of the others. But yes, there is a sequel. It's in the works. I'd say it's uh, nearing about halfway done. Um, the process will be a lot quicker. I don't know if it's going to be published this year only because there might be some things in it that I want to be completely detached from the Navy before we publish. I but know. yeah, but it will be longer. Uh, number one thing that people say is, is it's too short of a book? It's not. It was written that way on purpose. Um, so it, this one will be a little bit more in depth. But Rattler's back, and uh, I think it'll be good. I think it'll be better. So if you like the first one, I like the second one better. If that counts. What's, what's the timeline, man? Are we are we on timeline here? Or are you like where, where are we at? <laughs> so the first book was published May eleventh of. 2021 on purpose. That was an anniversary date for me of uh, 19 years since I commissioned in the Navy. That's awesome. My goal is to do something special like that for book two. Uh, I will be retired June 1st of 2022. So. Well, that story is going to get a lot better after after that date. We'll have a lot of the real, the real Wombat story. Once the handcuffs are <laughs> off. Uh, even my wife says that she goes, "Wow, that's going to be." She goes, "I don't know if I'm prepared to hear those stories." And I'm like, "You're not." I can't wait. <laughs> so, um, but no, it has been good. The book's been selling good. Uh, I appreciate everybody's gotten it. It went to number one in a couple categories uh, on Amazon, which was pretty nice. cool. I was shocked. Um, so I really do appreciate that. The audiobook is coming out. Uh, I know I keep saying I'm going to announce who it is. I'm, I'm waiting. You're going to like it. He's a professional, and he's going to blow you away if you like audiobooks. Um, and like I said, there's critics out there. I'd like to address the one we talked about. Um, sure. So one of my favorite critics uh, talked about how the picture in the book does not look like me. Well, there's no uh, makeup right now, right? <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> they're assuming that my, my, my computer in my office is the quality of an iPhone. Because that's actually where the picture was taken for the book. It was an iPhone in my house. Yeah. So, uh, but it is funny just to... Uh, just to hear the different takes of people. Um, my favorite authors kind of always do a, like a hater comment. And it's fun once you get over the fact that it's like being stabbed in the heart whenever somebody <laughs> says something poor about what you've written. But my favorite thing is, is I ask people, please give negative comments, but at least proofread your negative comment. Because my favorite thing in the world is, talking about my content in a book that's 200 pages long when you can't write a two sentence review. It's not grammatically correct. Right. Well, so it's fun. It's been a fun experience. I really have enjoyed it. 
Um, we'll see what happens. But there is going to be a sequel. There's going to be a sequel. I was, right. was going to hide it. There's going to be a sequel. I like it too much. It's fun. No, man, it's your baby. It's awesome. Listen, I uh, I have no writing talent at all. So somebody asked in the chat, Gonky, where's your book? Uh, and it would just be a rambling of incoherent sentences. I, I disagree. I think it'd be more like a coloring book or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Try to stay in the lines, you know, but it'd be good. Yeah, I mean, people so would there is a question about the E2. Uh, there is a simulator. It was very archaic, but it did reproduce the awe from the torque of the cross. Nice. So, well, good, man. Yeah, no, it's fun. I'm excited about it, man. I really am. It's really? fun. Um, I, I ran into somebody the other day who didn't realize that I had written the book and had it and told me that I should read this book that he read since I was an E2 pilot. Yeah, I like the book, and I thought that was pretty cool. So, well, awesome. Well, I'm not an author, or whatever. Uh, you know, I'm buying another trailer park, which is scary and exciting. Hey, that's yeah. Because if you can't be a real fighter pilot anymore, I guess you can just do real estate, buy trailer parks. But this does sound like a, um, <laughs> a setup for a movie, right? Like <laughs> they come back and they get the hero who's just working at some trailer park somewhere. I think that, World I think War Three. I could write this book too. Maybe Gonky has his own book. Can I get the rights to that? Can we sign something? Instead of Maverick, it'd be Iceman. How he went from being uh, number one at Top Gun to a trailer trailer park mogul. <laughs> yeah, but you assume that you were number one at Top. That's true. So that's a stretch as well. <laughs> um, well, dude, well, there's one more question. Uh, a really good question that got asked with regards to what we talked about tonight, and then we'll probably wrap it up. Uh, Where's it at? I technology challenged. Uh, it was basically, I can't remember the guy's name. I know the question, but it was basically what is, what is a shit hot? So while that, I know what a shit hot is, but as an, as an L oh here, <laughs> Jaeger bomb B1188. Great Can name. Guys explain a shit hot landing. I'm so glad you asked that question because that is extremely carrier uh relevant it's only pl only place where you can get the upgrade is out at the ship and i yeah. think i'm not even, i'm not even sure guys even are trying it nowadays but wombat did you ever give the shit hot upgrade and what did you guys look for i attempted it a couple times but what did you get the upgrade <laughs> you can't upgrade a cut pass on a shit hot <laughs> so you uh, explain it first, and I'll tell my very short story. So a shit hot break is such where normally when you come up for the initial at the ship, you go a mile ahead of the ship. So you fly over the ship on the right side, you go a mile upwind, and then you break. And then however many seconds, you know, depending on your aircraft and interval behind you. The shit hot break is you break behind the ship, essentially. So to get the upgrade from me, and I will tell you that I have given it, uh, and I have also given the shit hot Hawkeye break because that is also difficult. And I've done one, and I've received that upgrade as well. Is in order to get it from me, none of your aircraft could cross over any part of the flight deck at any point until you land. So what that means, if you haven't been there, is you are basically coming as fast as you can and breaking as hard as you can and doing a continual 360 degree turn to show up at the right spot, three quarters of a mile behind the ship. It is extremely difficult to do. Um, you have to you have to really know what you're doing to pull it off because likely you're gonna screw it up a couple times as you practice, you're gonna get waved off and all the stuff that we talked about um, before about not highlighting yourself and all that. Remember, we're trying to land a plane every 45 seconds. So when you wave off, you did not do that. and. It's a good chance you're going to get talked to. So uh, it is amazing to see. I have watched some really senior guys do it, uh, and it is it is everything that that Snort Snodgrass and and all these guys define naval aviation at. If it's still going on, I hope it is. I hope somebody who's out there right now, still active duty, tells me it's going on. It would make my heart warm. I know. My guess is it's not, um, but it is. It's fun to fly. It's almost as fun to watch one done right from the LSO platform. It's really like a mini air show. Um, and your window of, of being, I mean, you, you don't have a window. You're either perfect or you're not there and you're out of there. And it's 
So yeah. it's the joke we would say is the uh, the air boss would come over the five MC over the loudspeakers on the flight deck, and if you had come in for the shit hot and he could see you at the ninety position and was like, not gonna <laughs> happen. You'd hear him come up and he's like, no chance paddles, and you just wave him off. Like there is no like even there, there's no way you can get to a good landing yeah. from there. So just get rid of them, and we would. And so the joke among LSOs, people that I'm friends with to this day that are LSOs. When something's happened that's bad, it's just like no chance battles. Like, well, yeah, it's like you said, man. You don't play games, but it's a game we play. Oh, it's a game, right? So, as a new guy, like that's what I dreamed of. Because, like you said, I saw some of these senior guys bring in the shit hot. And it is the gnar. It, it it like it encompasses the like it defines flying skill, in my opinion. Like, yes. there's no, there's nothing else. There's nothing else like it out there. Uh, you can't do any like you can't do it at the field. Like no. you can't do it at a land base. You have to do it behind a ship, and yeah. you I need your airport slightly moving away for you. So yeah, to make it work. I remember um, being a new guy, and I was like, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to bring it today." And the older guys are like, "No, don't do it. You're gonna dick it up." And I'm like, "Listen." I need some tips or I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to spitball yeah. this thing. It's going to be it's happening one way or another. <laughs> right. Right. I can have some tools in my tool toolbox or I can just give it the old gonky try. It's probably going to end up real bad. Mm -hmm. You know, I, dude, if you, right, if you get waved off or if you bolter because you're, you're trying to do this, <clears throat> playing these reindeer games, the nuclear powered ship has to keep steaming. I mean, you think of the money and the cost and the, I mean, it's a big deal. Yep. So I know if you asked, did I ever get the upgrade? I did get the upgrade, um, but I think they gave it to me because it was my last pass in my fleet squadron. So I came back. That is also an upgrade, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, they, I came back with, uh, with a buddy of mine and uh, I was actually on his wing and I was like, Hey man, it's going to be my last, my last pass as a fleet JO. He's like, all right, you got the lead because we both knew we were going to get to break the deck. And yep. like Wombat's saying, you got to break before the ship and you got to have enough speed. It's the speed that counts. Yeah. If you break behind the ship at 350 knots, you, you're going to be all gooned up. So um, I was, you know, there's, I, I've seen guys coming at over 600 knots. That, that yep. I, I came in at 500 knots and I broke right before the back of the ship. Did you angle it? Uh, yeah, I did angle it a little bit, and I'm not gonna lie, I probably cheated a, a little hundred feet low. Got to cheat a little bit too. <laughs> um, but you know, I felt like King Kong, and to be honest, like when I hit the ninety, I was like, man, I could have carried another fifty knots easy. Yep. I, I did get it slowed down, but I, I didn't grab the one. I think I grabbed the two, and uh, they came. Hey, you. That's a good pass for you. <laughs> it's, extreme, it's rare. But yeah, they gave me the uh, they gave me the upgrade. But uh, I, like, truth be told, the guys like like uh, there was the Satan right six hundred knots, six hundred feet, point six behind the ship. <laughs> For the less experienced, was triple nickel, right? Yep. <laughs> so, um, but that was uh, that that was something that all the new guys were all like, "How fast can we bring it in?" Today? That's what you aspire to be. Yeah, how fast can you bring it in and can you stick it? You got to stick the landing, you know? It's Always like, stick the landing. If you don't, you're just quitting. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a great question, man. I'm glad I got it. No, it's good. And Frank mentioned it's either made to, to bring the jet aboard the boat quickly or to show off. It's 100% to show off. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Like, one mess is the gnarliest thing ever, man. You get a guy that's like doing six bills and he's in the break and he's, he's in a hornet. If it's at all any moisture in the air, it's like oh, a cotton it's just a cotton ball going around the uh, yeah. It's beautiful. It is just, beautiful. <laughs> it is everything that I raised my right hand for. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. It's the reason I salute a flag. It's the reason my son salutes a flag. Everything. Wrapped <laughs> into one maneuver in a plane. It's amazing. I love it. I miss it. That's the one thing. Um, I'd love to just try it one more time. Oh yeah. You would totally screw it away. <laughs> <laughs> now picture trying to do it in a Hawkeye where you can't see anything. Oh yeah, dude. Like my brain tells me I could stick it, but like I'm sure I'd probably fly to the water. <laughs> You'd be fine. So uh, <laughs> all right. Well, hey man, we're at the hour hour fourteen. Oof, it's been fun, man. It really has. Um, 
we need to do it more often. I think it's fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Juan, for coming on. I really, like I said, I really want to dive into the LSO and the boat ops a little bit just for my own sake. And one of these days, maybe my kid or your kid might listen to this. But sure. I want to thank everybody who – you signed on and listen to us babble. Uh, I'll try to have these, you know, a little more often. Than I have just been so busy with life, but I want to thank everybody. Wombat, thank you for your time, man. And absolutely, man. You guys have a good night, and uh, till the next time, man. We'll we'll uh, uh, sign off. And hey, I'll talk. I'll talk to you later, Wombat. All right, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. See you, man. See you guys.